Hello, literary themes and poetry students. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you find yourselves at this particular moment uh, doing well with all the difficulties that we've had thrust upon us. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly here at the beginning about uh, the shape that our class will take now that we have migrated towards an online format. And we will spend uh, today's class period looking at Seamus Haney's uh, poem, Punishment. That will be most of what we do today. So just to bring you up to speed, um, what is there to say? Um, the semester has not been extended. So we will finish our studies this term uh, by May 15th. Uh, the result of that, the fact that we've lost the preceding three weeks since school was closed on March 13th, uh, means that we will probably have a little bit less graded work on the books than was imagined at the beginning of the semester. Uh, you still have your term paper to turn in. Uh, the due date has been extended on the term paper. I believe I've mentioned that previously. So uh, it is the week of, I believe, the 22nd or the 23rd. I can confirm the date with you uh, before but it is no longer uh, the 15th. <clears throat> and my intention is to put up uh, modules on the various poems that are uh, under consideration for topics on the term paper assignment uh, in advance of that time. So today we'll be working on punishment and I will try to put up modules perhaps even before we see them in class uh, for Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn and Wordsworth's Chintern Abbey, uh, Derek Walcott's uh, Ruins of a Great House and the other poems that are on that list. Uh, I'll try to put them up uh, sooner rather than later. That way you'll have access to the lecture material. And if you're working on that particular poem uh, for your term essay, you can at least have the advantage of that information that I would give you. Um, in the end, uh, most of your work should be based on your research. So it's not an absolute imperative that we have covered the poem in class uh, before you turn in your essay, but obviously there would be advantages associated with that. Uh, and then probably we will have one final written assignment uh, that would be a cumulative assignment, probably addressing one or several poems uh, from the, what that we've studied in the semester. And I would probably give you that uh, much as if it were an in-class writing assignment. So I will propose the question and you will have a certain period of time to respond to it. And you could send me in uh, your draft for that. So of course, uh, one of the uh, side effects of that is that uh, some of the assignments will take on a different weighting than was initially stated in the uh, course outline at the beginning of the semester because there are fewer uh, fewer assignments. I will tinker with those on Omnivox and I'll try to convey that to you as clearly as possible. Okay, so um, <clears throat> also we will be typically having uh, a Zoom question and answer period. Uh, that will occur, uh, there's two groups of this class, so if you're in the Monday, Wednesday afternoon group, uh, the Zoom conference would typically occur uh, at the end of the class time on Wednesday. So it would typically be from 3 o'clock uh, on Wednesdays. And if you're in the Tuesday, Thursday, uh, 8.30 to 10.15 class, the Zoom conference would be on Thursdays from 9.30 to 10.15. And so in both of those cases, uh, you would be invited. You will receive an invitation uh, into your Leia account uh, at the time, those stated times. And if you are available and if you are interested in posing questions uh, about the things we've covered in class, you can come to those conference calls and you can raise your questions. Those are not going to be lectures, so I'm not going to be talking about the poems per se. I'm going to be answering your questions about the poems. And so it's important that you have questions because if you don't, then there won't be very much talking going on. Um, <clears throat> and those questions can be about anything associated with the course. If you have questions related to your 
uh, term essay assignment. If you have questions related to the assignments left to be turned in later, uh, you can certainly pose those questions at that time. So the, uh, the goal there is to give you an opportunity to interact. Also, the forums uh, for the classes have been activated on Omnivox, and so you can also pose questions there. The forum would give you the opportunity to exchange ideas both with your classmates and to uh, present questions also to me. I will check them uh, on a regular basis, but much like email, you know, I'm not going to obsessively monitor those threads. If you have something to say, say it. Um, I'll see it typically, you know, within 24 hours, except if it's on the weekend, uh, I would be able to respond to those, uh, to those posted questions. So I think that covers uh, most of the little bureaucratic things that have uh, stood in our way. I know it's probably been uh, an extremely stressful period for most of you. I know it has been for me for a variety of reasons. Um, and hopefully you're getting you know, some semblance of normalcy uh, is coming back to your lives in these times of quarantine and social distancing and the like. So uh, as I mentioned, the poem that we're going to be working on is a poem by Seamus Haney. Seamus Haney is a is an Irish poet. Actually, he's from Northern Ireland. He's from Belfast. Um, he was my teacher at university, and he's a, an incredibly uh, esteemed teacher. He won the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature. At one point uh, in Boston, while I was a student, uh, there were three Nobel laureates, uh, Seamus Haney, uh, Derek Walcott, who the poet will study soon, and Joseph Brodsky. Um, the three of them were institutions in the Boston area, so it created kind of a special, special moment there. Um, these people being in town and reading and teaching uh, created a, a kind of a, a critical mass of poetic uh, importance, let's say. So uh, the poem Punishment comes from a volume that was published in 1975 called North, and it's a part of a series of poems which are collectively known as the Bog Poems, and the reason they are called that is because uh, these poems, Punishment, uh, another one called Tolland Man and uh, Garled Man also, there, there are three or four poems, um, and all of them have at their heart uh, these references to mummified, uh, what are known as bog bodies, um, that these were people that were uh, lived during the, the Iron Age time in Northern Europe, and for whatever reason, they were killed or died, uh, and their bodies were mummified, were naturally preserved in bogs. In Northern Europe, you have uh, something known as peat, peat bogs. Peat is a, it's an organic, uh, it's organic matter <clears throat> that typically, uh, it's kind of densely packed in the ground, and it's used in places like Ireland uh, Northern England and Scotland, if you go to a pub, they will uh, harvest the peat. You have bog cutters who go in and they cut this turf. It's like soil, but it's soil that has a very, very high component of organic matter in it, and it can burn. So they typically harvest the peat, they roll it up into logs, and then they let it dry, and then you can put it in a fire and use it as a source of fuel. Um, now, that's not that important for the purposes of the poems, but what is important is that these bogs, which are kind of marshy areas uh, where this peat is, are typically, uh, what happens is when something is put inside those bogs, it hermetically seals because it's very, it's like mud kind of, but not quite mud. Um, and so what ends up happening is they hermetically seal off uh, whatever it is that is found underneath the ground, it, it keeps the air away from them, and it ends up um, in the process preserving them. And so these bodies in these poems, the one at the heart of the poem Punishment that we're going to work on today, and these other poems that I just mentioned brief, recently, um, were typically bodies that were typically killed. Usually there was some ritual, uh, primitive ritual murder associated with it, and the bodies were put into the peat bogs, and they were preserved, they were mummified. So the bodies, uh, thousands of years later, are still there. It's a bit like the Egyptian mummies that you find um, that were embalmed and wrapped. Uh, these were uh, wrapped, but 
preserved due to natural process. Uh, and so all of the um, all of these poems have that at their heart. And so <clears throat> if we take a look uh, at the poem Punishment, we have a first person speaker. The persona in the poem is speaking about himself <clears throat> and he's uh, describing a situation. Basically, the situation is one where a young woman is being punished. The punishment of the poem um, is a ritual killing, and the woman is being punished for the crime of adultery. <clears throat> and he imagines himself uh, as a, a viewer watching this happen. So I'm going to read the poem, <clears throat> and then we'll talk a little bit about the context. I can feel the tug of the halter at the nape of her neck, the wind on her naked front. It blows her nipples to amber beads. It shakes the frail rigging of her ribs. I can see her drowned body in the bog, the weighing stone, the floating rods and boughs, under which at first she was a barked sapling that is dug up, oak bone, brain firkin. Her shaved head like a stubble of black corn, her blindfold a soiled bandage, her noose a ring to store the memories of love. Little adulteress, before they punished you, you were flaxen-haired undernourished, and your tart black face was beautiful. My poor scapegoat, I almost love you, but would have cast, I know, the stones of silence. I am the artful voyeur of your brain's exposed and darkened combs, your muscles webbing and all your numbered bones. I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar, wept by the railings, who would connive in civilized outrage, yet understand the exact and tribal intimate revenge. Um, the poem is kind of hard <clears throat> in a certain sense. It has a sexualized, sensualized quality to it, uh, which is sort of strange uh, because it's uh, eroticizing uh, a murder, a capital punishment, basically. And so that m rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Um, Haney is making a link between these rituals, these Iron Age rituals from, you know, early European societies, and he's making a connection to the contemporary situation in Northern Ireland. Seamus Haney is from Belfast in Northern Ireland, but he is a Roman Catholic. And if you know anything about the geopolitical situation in Northern Ireland, uh, the, <clears throat> the four counties that constitute Northern Ireland are majority Protestant, uh, and they are separated from the rest of the island, which is known as the Republic of Ireland, which is a different country, and that is majority Catholic. Uh, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, so it's associated with England, uh, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, uh, and so the, they're ruled by uh, the, the parliament and the government in London. Uh, this has created a whole bunch of tension, and during the 60s and 70s uh, into the 1980s, there was something known as the Troubles, and the Troubles were a period of time where there was political upheaval, and groups from, uh, from the Republic of Ireland, in particular uh, a group sympathetic to the cause of the Republic of Ireland, known as the Irish Republican Army, um, created a whole bunch of upheaval. Uh, there was terrorist acts on both sides. <clears throat> the Protestant uh, side, uh, there were groups known as the Ulster Defense League and a whole bunch of other uh, par paramilitary groups that were basically defending the Protestant side. And so you had bombings and you had all sorts of uh, you know, kidnappings and retaliatory murders. Uh, if you've ever listened to the rock group U2, uh, they have a famous song, Sunday Bloody Sunday, which refers to that period. They're from Ireland as well. <clears throat> and so you have this ongoing uh, climate of political, uh, political violence, basically. And this is something that's alluded to in the poem. When we look towards the end of the poem, you'll see it's making references to contemporary episodes. So it's connecting this deep historical episode uh, with something much later into the 1970s at the time that the poems were written. So we start with the speaker who, as I said, is kind of voyeuristic. He's speaking in the first person singular, uh, personal pronoun, I. 
I can feel the tug of the halter at the nape of her neck, the wind on her naked front. Okay, so he's almost putting himself in her place. He's imagining what it feels like. But he's, as I said, he's eroticizing this. He's, he's using uh, descriptors, descriptors that uh, focus on something sensual, right? Her naked front, it blows her nipples to amber beads, okay? Uh, the woman's nipples are erect. And this is, you know, amber beads. It, on the one hand, it could be something sexual or sensual. Um, but here, it's probably a question of fear. This woman is about to be killed. Um, and so there's something kind of horrific uh, equating those two things and in the way that, that it's portrayed. Uh, the woman is extremely vulnerable. She seems to be uh, frightened, weak, frail, uh, is one of the words used to describe her. Um, and she seems to be, yeah, just... Uh, almost uh, almost a non-presence in a certain way. Now, the context of the poem, as I mentioned, when we look at the Bog poems, typically uh, Haney became interested in a book by the unfortunately named author P.V. Glob. Um, and P.V. Glob wrote a book called The Bog People that spoke about these mummified corpses that were found in the bogs of Jutland in Northern Europe and that had been preserved. And typically they were people who had been punished or had been uh, murdered for, for various variety of reasons. Most of these are pagan, they're pre-Christian. And so there's almost like human, human sacrifice, basically. Um, and so uh, Glob wrote about these various bodies and they have names. Uh, they exist in museums in Germany and in Denmark. Um, and you have the Tolland Man, which Haney wrote a poem about. And this particular poem is based on uh, a, a person who existed thousands of years ago. Uh, and she is known as the Windeby Bog Girl um, because she was found in the Windeby Bog. And so <clears throat> if you see, if you look that name up on the internet, you'll find images of her that are vaguely uh, pertain to the image that Haney is portraying for us. And we see later in the poem uh, that what we're looking at is precisely this voyeuristic quality. On the one hand, he looks like he's spying on an intimate act with this person. And it's also the intimate act of uh, a person staring at a body in the museum, right? In the latter phases of the poem, when he says, I am the artful voyeur of your brain's exposed and darkened combs, your muscles webbing, and all your numbered bones, okay? He's talking about looking at this body in a vitrine, in a museum context, right? And the numbered bones are the things that you reconstruct, right? When you put a body back together. And so we have this awkward uh, imaginative leap where the speaker is in a, an institutional setting, looking at this body, and he is taking this... Uh, extrapolation and he's imagining what had happened to this woman and so the description that he gives us in the early phases of the poem are very much the physical description of what she went through uh, now of course the the physical description uh, is allied very closely with the image of the windy bog girl and so what do we know about her she seems to have been punished as we said, for the crime of adultery. In the middle of the poem, he says, um, her noose a ring to store the memories of love, little adulteress, before they punished you, you were flaxen-haired, undernourished, and your tar-black face was beautiful. Okay, um, And so she's being punished for the crime of adultery. And of course, adultery is a crime, um, I don't want to say it's a victimless crime, but it's a crime that some of us might not call a crime. Um, if, if people are married and they are consensual in having a relationship outside of marriage, um, then adultery in principle shouldn't be criminal and certainly seems like it shouldn't be capital offense, an offense that you are killed for. Um, now, societies have often taken a, a rather strange uh, approach to that, and certainly it is something that is often uh, seen in a decidedly negative way, and as we said, we might we might deem that excessive in the way that this is punished. 
in the poem, uh, the young woman is being punished for adultery. And of course, it's this kind of very ritualistic portrayal of her. Uh, she is tied. He begins, I can feel the tug of the halter at the nape of her neck. Um, she's naked. She's unclothed. Um, and so this is kind of, there's an element of humiliation here. Um, <clears throat> she's frail, the frail rigging of her ribs, uh, her drowned body. He mentions uh, the shaving of her head. The shaving of the head has been a, a very common uh, type of punishment for women who give uh, aid and comfort to the enemies. The most famous place you saw that is in <clears throat> uh, occupied France during World War II when the Nazis uh, were in control of France for several years and a number of French women um, in order to perhaps benefit themselves through the, the deprivation of the war years. Some of them slept with some of the Nazi soldiers uh, that were occupying France at the time. And typically when the war ended and when the Nazis were driven out of France, uh, the women who did that did not fare very well. And you have some very famous images. If you go and again, search on the internet for this, you'll find images of women uh, being publicly humiliated, people throwing things at them, and then in a public square having their heads shaved. Um, shaving, shaving of a woman's head is often uh, sort of depriving her of her femininity and her sensuality, sexuality. Uh, and so you see that here, right, where the, the woman who is being punished has had her head shaved, um, her shaved head like a stubble of black corn, her blindfold a soiled bandage, bandage <clears throat> her noose a ring to store the memories of love. Okay, and the noose is of course the thing that uh, restrains her around the neck. Typically that's how you hang someone. Um, and we see the person here being presented to us in a very sort of sympathetic tone terms, but also kind of neutral, not very emotionally engaged. There's some weird level of detachment and of course, uh, the the speaker in the poem also he uses the word voyeur right and a voyeur is somebody who watches uh, someone else involved in something that should be private and intimate and he feels like a voyeur he's talking about uh, the fact of being in the museum looking at this the Windeby Bog girl's body but he's also making an equation he's connecting it to the act of what happened to her the act of punishment that was for her um, and he feels an affection. I almost love you and would have cast, I know, the stones of silence. Okay, um, so this rather strange, uh, detached appreciation of the woman and in particular appreciation of her physical body, which is kind of the talisman that has animated the entire poem. Uh, the woman, the woman's body in this vitrine in a museum is now something that he's looking at and as I said, taking this imaginative leap back to the act that uh, happened <clears throat> and he says I would I almost love you but would have cast I know the stones of silence um, and you have to ask yourselves here why why does he feel the way he does now the latter the latter part of the poem connects this woman's plight to the plight of young women in Northern Ireland the last lines let us understand what in fact the poem is trying to say I've talked briefly previously about the, uh, the geopolitical situation in Northern Ireland and the idea of the troubles. The troubles were a very violent time. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the poem, he's referring to women, uh, Irish women, Northern uh, Irish women who basically gave uh, aid and comfort to the British soldiers, the British soldiers who were basically present in, um, in Northern Ireland because it was an occupying army for a good number of years. And so some of the women who uh, slept with the soldiers were then treated very, very badly by the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And so the last two stanzas are referring precisely to that. I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar wept by the railings, who would connive in civilized outrage yet understand the exact and tribal infinite, intimate revenge. So uh, the, the two last stanzas in the poem 
create this connection. We have three different episodes, basically, in this poem. The first episode is the episode that the speaker is imagining. He's not present there, obviously, because the speaker is a contemporary person, but he's imagining thousands of years ago the instance when this young woman uh, was killed, and he's imagining watching her, and he's imagining it happening, and he's talking about his emotions, what he feels about it. And on the one hand, he feels a great deal of sympathy for the person, but he also feels a certain level of complicity with the people punishing her. And we might ask ourselves why that's the case. Um, so that's the first episode. The second episode is the speaker in a museum looking at the bones and the body of this woman. And that's the place where the imaginative leap occurs. And then the third scenario is him remembering, and we can see from his, uh, from his use of verb tense here, that he has some connection to this. He's using a perfect tense. I who have stood dumb, okay? When you say I have stood dumb, okay, you're talking about something that happened previous to now, but somehow connects to now. In other words, the, the action that occurred in the past has some influence on the present. Um, so I who have stood dumb, uh, to stand dumb, dumb is a word that we typically use to mean stupid, but the origins of dumb means silent. If you stand dumb, it means you don't say anything. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, what is he talking about? He has stood dumb. In other words, he has stood and watched something and not intervened. I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar, wept by the railings. <clears throat> the betraying sisters refers precisely to these episodes I was talking about a few moments ago, uh, where women in Northern Ireland, typically in Belfast, which is the largest city in Northern Ireland, um, who gave aid and comfort to the enemy, and in this case we're talking about sexual favors with the British soldiers, um, where then uh, their heads were shaved, they were often painted with tar and poured feathers on them, tarred and feathered, and then they were handcuffed um, to, there's a whole bunch of wrought iron railings in the center of uh, Belfast, and they were basically brought out there and handcuffed to those railings and left to sit um, and this is obviously a very, very public humiliation. Uh, it, they weren't killed, uh, but, they were, but they were displayed in a very public way so that their families and friends and other people uh, would see them. And so it's mostly a crime of humiliation. Now, uh, the poem turns on precisely what this means. Uh, what, is, what are these episodes? What do they mean? <clears throat> We've seen, as I said earlier, the, the speaker within the poem is kind of titillated curiously about uh, the woman that's being punished in the first parts. And he's, again, imagining himself back into this place. Then he talks about um, the fact that he's very attracted to her. He finds her uh, attractive and says, I, I almost love you. Okay. Um, now, the way he refers to her is kind of curious, right? He gives her these, uh, he's making a direct address to her, right? Apostrophe within the poem, a little adulteress, okay? Little, she, she seems to be very young. She's almost a girl more than a woman. It feels like the way she's being described to us. Um, little adulteress, before they punished you, you were flaxen haired, undernourished, and your tar black face was beautiful. My poor scapegoat. Okay, and remember, we've seen this word previously, um, a scapegoat, uh, is a person who is typically uh, used to take the blame for something else. Um, and obviously, in the crime of adultery, there's a curious reality in that who is it that's getting punished? And historically, typically, it's the woman. The, it's a crime that the woman seems to take a disproportionate uh, blame for. And so she is a scapegoat. Uh, and he feels an attraction, an affinity, and some sort of sympathy for her. But unfortunately, the nature of what he feels for her is not sufficient to allow him to act on her behalf. And he's, when he says, my poor scapegoat, I almost love you, uh, the following lines, but I would have cast, I know, the stones of silence. 
to the stones of silence are an interesting uh, reference because in the Gospel of John, uh, in the New Testament of the Bible, Jesus comes upon uh, a situation where a woman has been caught uh, in precisely in the crime of adulterous behavior and she is about to be punished. And the punishment um, in this situation is lapidation, stoning. And it was typically, it has been typically um, a punishment quite closely associated with adultery. Actually, when I was a graduate student, um, I wrote a, a paper on this particular poem because this would have been in the 1990s. Um, and there was an episode in, I believe it was Nigeria, where a young woman had been uh, arrested and actually she had been raped and she was raped by, she was married, but she was raped by uh, a man who was not her husband. And she was caught and she was determined to be guilty of adultery in this particular case. And this was in a northern, uh, an area, a very rural area in Nigeria. And the punishment, the, the deemed appropriate punishment for her was going to be lapidation. She was going to be stoned. This is, um, I believe, Sharia, uh, traditional Islamic law. And so it was being applied to her in perhaps a, what one would consider an unjust fashion. And so this uh, became an international incident, and I believe it was Amnesty International and uh, you know various governments tried to intervene in her behalf, and it was it became uh, something that was being discussed in the press a great deal, and it just so happened I was a student at the time, and I had been working on this poem, and so I wrote uh, I wrote a paper on this that I presented at a, at a conference, and. Uh, the connection between sort of the situation, the Iron Age situation of the, the young woman, flaxen-haired, undernourished with her tar-black face, the women in the poem uh, related to the IRA, and this contemporary, at that point, uh, episode of a young Nigerian woman who was also going to be punished, and this sort of this unjust, uh, misogynistic tone here. So... That was, uh, that was relevant at the time. Uh, it's kind of interesting in the sense that the poems tend to continue to have life and there's a relevance to the, the topics that they are addressing. So when, um, when Haney uses the line here, I but would have cast, I know, the stones of silence, he's referring to this episode in the Gospel according to John where Jesus comes upon uh, a young woman who is about to be stoned by a crowd for the crime of adultery, again, this recurring theme. And he says famously, um, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Um, in other words, all of you are sinners, and so anyone who is here is also a sinner, and so you should not take it upon yourself to judge uh, this poor woman. Um, now, of course, uh, <clears throat> that, you know, what, what Haney is alluding to here, that he would have cast the stones of silence, it's kind of an interesting um, metaphor, because what he's saying is, I, I feel for you, <clears throat> and he's talking again, he's addressing very directly the woman uh, in the time of Iron Age society who is standing there about to be punished, but he knows, I almost love you, but would have cast, I know, the stones of silence. Um, he knows from experience that he would not have intervened on her behalf. Um, and where that comes from is something that is unfolded for us later. I am the artful voyeur of your brain's exposed and darkened combs, your muscles webbing, and all your numbered bones. Okay, And that idea of the artful voyeur uh, can be obviously the speaker with a certain level of self-awareness. can also reflect back on the poet, artful, um, doing something for artistic reasons, voyeur, um, intruding in a personal, intimate, and private uh, affair for someone. Um, and so I am the artful voyeur of your body. Um, in other words, it's almost like seeing someone as they're getting dressed or something. This person is dead and they're in a museum box, so it's not quite the case. Um, but the reason he knows this is precisely because he has, he has previous experience. I, who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters call and tar wept by the railings. In other words, I who have stood dumb means I did not speak up then. 
and therefore I would not speak up in this other instance, right? And so the stones of silence become kind of a complicity. You're throwing the stone because you're not ready to speak up on someone's behalf, kind of the idea. If you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. And in this particular instance, um, <clears throat> the speaker is recognizing it's a level of self-awareness. And so the ending of the poem is kind of curious, right? I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar wept by the railings. Okay. He's talking about the betraying sisters. There's a, obviously a familial relationship, betrayal. Okay. This woman and those women, the women who the IRA has punished for their complicity with the enemy, um, they had a similar, similar fate, similar experience. They were both punished. Um, and what's important, I think, is what you get at the end of the poem, the sensibility of the poem. Um, I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar wept by the railings, who would connive in civilized outrage, yet understand the exact and tribal intimate revenge. And in this case, the, that last stanza really packs most of the meaning of the poem. So that I in the previous stanza carries over for this one. I who have stood dumb and I who would connive. Connive is an interesting verb. To connive means to take offense falsely. To connive someone is to trick them. And so I who would connive in civilized outrage, in other words, he would pretend to be outraged. And of course the, the adjectival form there, civilized outrage, because we're talking about something that's kind of primitive. We're talking about this uh, Iron Age society. Um, so the civilized outrage is a modern person's perspective on this pagan primitive idea, capital punishment. There are still places that, that exercise capital punishment. Some people feel that it's inappropriate and wrong, and you might have civilized outrage, but you might pretend to have civilized outrage and not really be outraged. You might support it. Um, so I who would connive in civilized outrage, I would pretend to be upset, but, and here the yet, um, understand the exact and tribal intimate revenge. And again, those series of, um, of modifiers there, I think are important. So he would connive in civilized outrage, but he would also understand, in other words, he feels something for the woman, the women uh, being punished, but he also feels something for the punishers. And I think probably there are a couple key words here. Certainly um, the noun that ends the poem, revenge, is a suggestion that there's something uh, strong, the idea of revenge. Now, what are you getting revenge on? Here it's something um, larger than you. It's outside of you. So understand the exact and tribal intimate revenge. Exact means that it fits, it's appropriate, it's the right scale for what we're talking about. Um, tribal, probably the most important word in the line there, is tribal revenge. Tribal implies um, kind of, again, it, there may be an element of primitivity to it, the tribe, uh, this group that has a, you know, a common affiliation. Now obviously that can relate to the episode um, earlier in the poem and this sense of these primitive Iron Age societies. But he's also making a comment on Irish society and the sectarian uh, violence of Catholics and Protestants and tribal um, can refer to that, this tribal quality, this tribal revenge. And certainly intimate implies that it is, uh, you know, personal, private perhaps, but there's something pure about it. It's not intimate in the sense of the woman um, and her private act, it's intimate for the people punishing her as if they're, uh, they're, the association that they have here is strong enough to justify um, what it is that they feel that they have to do. And so this intimate revenge is exact and tribal. It fits the bill and it suits these purposes. And so the overall feeling um, in the poem is kind of this strange ambivalence where the speaker feels, uh, as I said, sympathy 
with the woman who is being punished in the initial phases of the poem, and sympathy to a certain extent with the betraying sisters. And yet he understands and accepts um, and, and accepts his complicity uh, with the fact that these punishments uh, have an importance and a place and that the place is actually valid, that he can accept and sustain uh, that, that role and what has happened here. And so he's uh, aware of his involvement and he's also not necessarily proud about it. I think that's an important aspect of what he's saying here is that he's, uh, he feels a wee bit of shame about how he feels, but yet that is how he feels, right? And so in the end, the speaker is sort of acknowledging in a certain sense, this connection back to these primitive pagan people from this modern, uh, you know, civilized society. And yet there's this deeper level of humanity and instincts and, and inclinations that humans have that he is uh, ready to acknowledge and accept. Uh, I think the poem is, is very, very powerful. I think it has a very interesting uh, element to it precisely because it is both historical uh, and uh, yeah, in the sense that it's connecting this deep, dark past to a present almost. I mean, the poem was written in 1975, but it's a present at the time of the poem. By the way, the Irish uh, situation had been rectified to some extent. Um, if you've followed anything, what's going on with Brexit, you're probably aware that uh, Northern Ireland will leave, has left, I guess, or will leave with uh, the UK, and Ireland uh, will remain part of the EU, the European Union. And so that frontier, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, will once again become a hard um, international border, which it hasn't really been recently because the European state has been um, sort of those borders have not really existed, but they will again. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, but the political situation with regards to Ireland and Northern Ireland is relatively, there's been a truce for a good number of years, and so it's been relatively calm. Uh, but back at the time that the poem was written, it was not calm. There were bombings all over the place, and, you know, in London and in Manchester and in Belfast and various uh, retaliatory acts. So the the immediacy of what was being alluded to here probably registered in a slightly different way um, when this was happening. So there you have um, our extended discussion of Seamus Haney's uh, poem, Punishment. As I said, I know some of you may be writing on this. So if you are, hopefully the information that we have discussed today uh, will be helpful for you in elaborating your points. Um, and so that's basically it for today. Um, I'll be coming back uh, to give you uh, more modules, probably in advance of the time that we cover the material in class, in the sense that, as I said, some of you might be writing on other poems. And so I'll try to produce those uh, modules as quickly as I can so that you can have access to them with uh, enough time to work for your term paper. Um, we will be having our Zoom classes either on the Wednesday or the Thursday, uh, depending on which group you're in. However, if you're in the Monday-Wednesday group, um, Wednesday's class does not occur this week because this Wednesday is now a Friday scheduled day to make up for the snow day we had back in February. Um, so that means that the next time we will meet is next Wednesday because Monday's class is also Easter Monday. Um, so that creates a little bit of a dilemma for us if you're in the Monday class. Certainly if you have any questions uh, that you need addressed in advance of our next meeting, please feel free to direct it to me either uh, directly via Mio or via the forum as well. So have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.